I'm going to give you guys a choice. Hi, my name is Malcolm Frost. I am a soldier, a United States Army soldier, and I'm a soldier for life. And you need to understand that up front. Uh, what I want to do is talk about, I'm going to give you a choice. We can talk about public affairs, which is, is good and fine, but I've done that for a year. And I want to talk a little bit about that potentially, but I also want to talk about leadership and, and what it is to be a company troop battery commander in your future and how to think about the art of command, the art of leadership and management, and what it means to be a professional in the United States Army. So given the choice, which one do you guys choose? Leadership? Public affairs. All right. We'll go, so we're going to go to leadership. So if we can go to the, uh, to the whiz wheel slide there, I'd appreciate it. So uh, what I want to talk to you about is you know, the art of command. People have heard about the art of command. We've talked about the art of command, the science of control. But uh, I don't think it's, and it's laid out in your ADPs and your ADRPs, right, our, and our doctrine to talk about it, values, uh, discipline, standards, you know, how do you set vision, key tasks, end state, and how do you lead. But it really hasn't been boiled down. And what I did was try and take it and put it into one chart. The art of leadership, the art of organizational management, the art of command in one slide by by me. And I tell you that the first thing you have to do, and you guys have all probably been platoon leaders, junior officers, you've led, so you kind of understand this a little bit, but I'll tell you, the first thing you do when you walk into an organization uh, with all of your ideas, priorities, your vim and vigor, is do what? You have to assess the OE, the operating environment. You need to understand the environment. Am I mechanized? Am I air assault? Am I airborne? What camp post or station am I at? What is, the, what is my commander's priorities? What kind of leadership do I have? How long have they been there in this unit? What is our mission? What is our unit's mission? Are we in green cycle where we're training? Are we in red cycle where we're on tasks, you know, supporting taskings? You have to understand your OE. You've got to know the people. You've got to know the environment. You've got to understand the organization. You have to understand the vision and the end state of your leaders one up and one down, one up and two up. That's the first thing. You cannot understand where to go and step off until you understand the environment. A lot of leaders and a lot of company troop battery commanders and even battalion and squadron commanders move out and say, I know exactly what I want to do. I'm going to have the best darn company troop battery in the United States Army, and this is how we're going to go, and this is how we're going to get there. And they've never assessed the operating environment. They've never nested themselves with the vision and understanding where they are and what their commander's intent is above them, and they just move out. And what happens? What happens if you focus just in on your company troop battery and say, I'm going to have the best damn company troop battery. I don't really care. I'm not going to worry about anything else external. What ends up happening? Yeah. You're not a member of the larger team, sir. Right. You're not part of the larger team. And what happens when you're not part of the larger team? You're not responsive to higher headquarters. You're not seen as a teammate and a team player and part of a greater team of teams. What happens? You lose trust from those organizations. Your reputation and the reputation of your organization suffers. And the irony is that you now have less time to do what it is that you want to do to have the best company troop or battery because what happens? You get a lot of love. You get a lot of help. You get a lot of focus and micromanagement from hire telling you what to do and how to do it because you have not created the chits and the reputation and the credibility to be able to lead your organization effectively in an empowered and decentralized environment, and you have earned the right to be micromanaged selectively. And the irony is, the opposite happens. The opposite happens. So, environment. And then once you understand the environment, what do you need to do? You have to have a vision for where you want to be. I don't care if you're part of a, if you're a battalion, battalion staff officers in S3, or squadron, commander, Troop commander, battery commander, doesn't matter. You have to have a vision. And that end state, the vision has to have an end state. You have to know where you want to be, whether it is a year from now, where the organization should be, should be six months from now, or where it should be the next quarter. Because if you get mired in the day-to-day -day and, re and the reactivity of everything that's going to come down on you and your organization, then you will never get to where it is that you need to get to. And you won't have a vision and a path and a road to get there. You won't have priorities. You won't have objectives. So what you need to do is you have to carve out the time to understand one and two levels up what's happening, create your end state and your vision that supports and is nested within that of those organizations, create that end state and a goal for where you want your organization to be, 
And then you have to thread enduring commander's intent through that. And I'm going to show you an example of enduring commander's intent. And enduring commander's intent is, not dif is different than commander's intent for every mission and task. You know, purpose, key, task, end state. That changes every time you get a new mission. But there are some enduring things, some objectives, and some traits, and some tenets you should have and your organization should have that keep you on a path to get towards that goal or that end state, which is your vision. And then how do you get there? What do you do? How do you control that as a leader? Three ways. Intent, guidance, climate. Commander's intent, commander's guidance, commander's climate. Those are the three things that allow you and your organization to manifest your vision in support of that operational environment that you now understand so well because you have assessed within the first 60 or 90 days. And you see the CG in the eye. That's climate, guidance, and intent. And those spoke out to seven wheels. And these seven wheels should be used as touch points for how to effectively run, lead, organize, and manage your organization. If you see that, you see two, two sets of stars. You have the art of command, the subjective side of how you lead as a leader, and you have the science of control. And each one of those bullets under each one of those headers in each of those circles has an art or a science of control, uh, art of command or science of control. And then you have internal and external. Where do you focus green? Green internal to your organization, and what is externally focused? Red. And do not think that the proportion of color in this slide is representative of what you should focus, because that changes based on what level of command you are at and you lead. And I'm going to show you a chart that demonstrates about how much percentage of your time a company true battery commander should spend internal and external, and how much so you have situational awareness your battalion squadron commander do and then your brigade commander does. And why they can do that and why they must do that. So I take you to the left top, values, discipline, standards. How do you make sure they're understood by all and that they are the same for all? How do you enforce? How do you enforce leaders? Leaders first. You understand this, pre-combat checks, pre-combat inspections, tasks, condition, standards. And how do you account? How, how do you hold them accountable? I'm not going to tell you the how. We can talk about the how and some techniques. But these are touch points. If you're not doing those things, if you're not adherent to, to the values, if you're, if you're first sergeant, if you have not empowered your first sergeant or your platoon sergeants to be the ones that are the standard bearers for discipline, for administration, and for standards underneath your guidance, which is your responsibility, then you're probably not going to get there. I think you understand that. Leader tone. I enter an organization the same way every single time. And those of you who have been successful platoon leaders or those of you who might have had a hard time, you may or may not understand this, but I'm here to tell you that I walk in, I implicitly trust every single person in that organization. They are professional. They know what to do. They adhere to standards and values. And, and I empower them to do the job through mission-oriented orders and tell them to move out. And when they fail, we're allowed to make mistakes. But you make mistakes once. Professionals do not make mistakes more than once. And if you continue to make mistakes, then you have earned the right to my selective micromanagement. I will empower and decentralize and give you all of the authority in the world that is you are charged to. But if you demonstrate that you are not tactically or technically proficient or have a standards or a discipline problem, et cetera, or can't communicate effectively, then we're going to work on that. And we can talk about counseling as well and how you do that. Climate controls. What do you think I mean by climate controls? Anybody? And it's internal and external. It's in the internal box, but it also is external. Anybody? No takers. Yep, go ahead. OK. And that's a way to figure it out, right? So, so you understand your climate because you have sensing sessions, right? But who sets the tone for the climate of the organization? The leader, right? Do you think you're the only one that sets the climate? Does the climate begin and end with you as a leader? Absolutely not. It extends to your first sergeant. It extends to your platoon leaders and your platoon sergeant and your XO. And guess what? The climate of your organization is going to be determined not by you. It will be led by you, but it must be enforced and held up by every leader in your organization and everyone that is part of your organization. Because internally they won't believe what you say if everyone else doesn't demonstrate what it is that you are doing from a climate perspective. And then externally, guess what happens? And this is how I did it. 
Nobody in my organization, XO, doesn't matter if it's battalion, doesn't matter if it's company, doesn't matter if it's brigade. You do not have the authority to say no to higher headquarters or any of your teammates who ask us for help to our left and right. That authority resides with me. No one is allowed to say no. Because guess what? If you get somebody who goes out there and starts having a bad relationship with battalion or squadron or says no all the time and isn't responsive and you don't know about it, you don't know, guess what? It's not just them. It's not just Frost, who is the XO for your company that's the one that's doing it. It is you, company commander, and Charlie Company, or Charlie Troop, or Charlie Battery, that is the one that has that reputation for not being responsive and not being a team player because that climate was emanated from others in your organization and you did not control that climate with left and right limits that demonstrate exactly where you want the organization to be in support of higher headquarters and others. And I also said no one is allowed to play unfriendly, get upset, pissed off at anyone else outside this organization. You're not allowed to. We're professionals. Everything is objective. Emotions don't come in. If emotions come in dealing with others outside the organization, that's how the, your organization is going to be perceived instead of being a professional organization unit that is mission focused and led by people that understand. And so climate controls, how do you set, maintain, monitor the climate and ensure that your personnel are developing the relationships external to the organization that demonstrate and are in tone and in line with your climate that you are setting inside the organization as well because reputation and trust is huge. Monitoring the tempo, trust and power, accountability. If I take you up to the upper right, unit rhythm, battle rhythm. What are the time horizon tools that you use? How do you look at your day on your calendar? What is the company or troop or battery calendar? What's the battalion squadron calendar? Are you nested and do you understand priorities, intent, command philosophy, and the calendars of your brigade commander and your battalion commander so that you can nest within that, understand it, and how are you organizing it, and, how, and what do you use as your temporal tools? Because I'm telling you, the day-to-day -day fight will eat your lunch. As a leader, and not just a leader, but your organization. And if you do not, and I carried a leader book, and I, I gave all of what was in that leader book to the platoon leaders of everything, in that huge leader book that talked about everything one level up and two level up. It had all of my purse stat logs, it had all my priorities, everything you can imagine. I carried all the way till I was a brigade commander. So I had a big enough staff that I was confident in. I knew enough that I think I was, I was good enough to be able to not carry it. <laughs> eight and a half by 11 book. I was you, eight and a half by 11 book, company commander. You walk into a meeting, you got everything. You're ready. You can understand, you can answer questions, you understand your organization. And you use, look at time horizon. How often do you meet? As an army, we meet to figure out what we're going to talk about in our next meeting. It's crazy. Daily meetings. Huddles up front and in the back where you take every single one of your leaders and you bring them in every day. And you waste an hour's worth of time to talk about two or three things that may affect two or three of them. Get used to the art of the touch point. So, mission style orders, intent, maybe once a week you have a huddle to demonstrate, okay, here's what we're going to do this week, here's some of the things we need to think about. But if you crush your people with meetings all of the time, the staff, when I say staff for you as a company troop battery commander, it's your platoon leaders, it's your platoon sergeants, right, and your XO, and your first sergeant, you have to allow them to do their work. And so have them come to you individually for stuff, but don't just have a meeting to have a meeting. What is the work balance? Because, boy, I'm telling you, the higher you get up, the worse we are in the Army for this. So think about that. What is the rhythm that you need to be able to empower your folks, give your priorities, give the intent, give guidance, have that climate set, and be able to have those touch points that you know and the milestones to be able to have them come back to you to give you updates on where they are? And do you need everyone there to do that? And how are you communicating what needs to be communicated across all of them? And when and how do you do that? If you don't think about that and let it happen willy-nilly or get driven by somebody else, then again, your priorities will become askew. Prioritization. How do you prioritize? You're going to have a thousand things. You are going to be, in the future, at the most junior level of command in the United States Army. And guess what? At Army level, we have four-star commanders, right? Chief of Staff of the Army. And then we have four-star commands with huge staffs. They give orders. Those orders come down to those three stars. They give orders. They come down to the two stars. 
They always come down to the colonels. And then guess what? All of those orders come down to the most junior, least experienced, and closest level of command to our soldiers in the United States Army, and that is you. And you have the least resources, staff, to execute. If you are not hyper-organized, if you do not prioritize what needs to get done, then I'm telling you, you're going to fail. And think about it. That is a weighty responsibility. All of those levels of command, putting all those tasks and those orders, and they're on your shoulders. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, actually. I mean, think about that responsibility that you're going to have. And, and, you know, there's a lot to do. And so that's a big responsibility. I ask you to take it with that import, understand it, but you have to prioritize. And if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority, and you have de facto relinquished prioritization to your subordinates. You have to clearly articulate what's a priority. Because again, if everything is a priority, I have worked for folks where 60 things were a priority, and I had to decide what I thought the boss thought was the highest priority and move out. I bet you all of you have done that as well. So are you going to relinquish that authority and responsibility to your subordinates to maybe execute it in what they think is a priority? Or are you going to clearly articulate what it is, whether it's for the day, for the week, for the month, or enduring across your command? And from a command perspective, how many ideas do you think you can have that are yours alone and implement in a 12 or 18 month command period? How many? Five, 10, 20, what do you think? You're lucky if you get one to two. So you better figure out in that first 90 days when you assess where you want to be in your end state and goal. Do I want, to, do, does, do I want this company, trooper battery to be the best trained in these tasks? And that's where I'm going to focus my highest priority. Do I want them to be the most physically fit? And that's where I'm going to put my priority. Do I want to, you know, what is it that you want to do that you think when you've assessed your organization that is best for your organization and nested within the commander's intent of the commander's one and two levels up and make it your own? Because everything else, I'm telling you, it's mission style orders. You're going to get it. It's going to come down. You're going to have too much to do that hire tells you to do anyway. So just know that. And pick and choose and think about it now after you've assessed. After you've assessed. Uh, sy systems and management, how do you organize? How do you organize uh, across your platoon leaders, across your XO and your first sergeant of the tasks and the things that come down? Are you efficient digitally? How do you use email? How do you use texting? How do you use written orders? How do you track tasks both in your email, in your, in your leader book, and the day-to-day -day stuff, and how do you task priorities from higher? How do you personally organize yourself and your organization to be able to deal with all that? It's tough. you got to think about that. And then I'm going to talk about executive influence and communication. You are at the level where this starts and is very, very important. Executive influence, executive communication. I talked a little bit about it with the climate piece. But you have to understand one and two levels up. you got to know that you are part in this information environment, you know, what's happened is we've collapsed the information environment so that the commands that stratify all the way from four star to, to, com to company troop battery command can, in a, in a millisecond, can collapse like that on an issue. And so how do you understand what's happening in the United States Army? What's going on politically? What's happening in Fort Stewart, Georgia, if you're going to 3ID? Because you understand what's going on, the dynamics in the community, and how things are affecting the organizations to your left and right. You have to know and think broader and deeper. It is just that type of environment. When I was a company commander, I didn't have to worry about that stuff. You do. You have to know what's happening in the environment at the political level, strategic level, operational level, joint, interagency, multinational, because that's the way we operate now, today, through the implements of power that our nation puts forth. You have partners here international partners. That's how we move forward now. Things are done as a coalition. So you have to have that framework, that concept. You have to understand it. I talked about one and two levels up. Okay, I, I personally despise four-star memos to every soldier. Two levels up, two levels down. Two levels up, two levels down. If you're micromanaging your soldiers, what do you think what do you think your squad leaders or section leaders think of you? 
You know, if your brigade commander is giving you stuff to do and telling your platoon leaders how to do things, in my personal estimation, he's a level below. He's in your wheelhouse, in your battalion or squadron commander's wheelhouse. I ask you to think about that. If it happens to you, do not mirror that activity. I challenge you for that. Executive influence, relationships. Relationships, relationships. Communication and relationships. It's not enough to communicate such that you are understood. You must communicate such that you are not misunderstood. That is a big difference. It's in the papers, the thoughts on leadership, I think, that you have in front of you. The art of communication. How many acronyms have I used in talking to you that I have not explained? Do I understand that I have civilians, that I have press, that I have international, that I have men, I have women, I have cross branches, I have said troop, company, battery. Do you understand your audience and do you know that they do not live in your mind when you communicate? Communication, the art of communication, it is written communication, verbal communication, body language, tone, intonation, what you say, how you say it, when you say it, who you say it to, who else is in the room when you say it. Inflection. It is the most important tool, that and the relationships that you build through effective communication that you have as a leader. I cannot overstate that. Cannot overstate that. It is an art form that you should personally, as I do, try and improve on every single day of your life. It makes for a hell of a lot better things at home with friends and with a spouse too, let me tell you. So just think about that. And how are you synchronizing your ideas? Executive influence, what, is, what do I mean by that? Let's say you have an idea or you have that priority that you want to get done. How do you get buy-in for that idea from your higher command? You know what you do? You make them think it's their idea. How do you do that? So how do you do that? You have to understand your higher commander's vision. You have to find something that you want to do that synchronizes nests or is a part of what they want to do. You have to develop the concept and the plan. You should hand that to the battalion or the squadron staff, and they will be thankful because you have helped them do work for their boss in one of their priorities. And then they will take that plan and they will make it their own. And if it's part of your higher hires commander's intent and vision and what they want to do, they will take that plan, they will brief it two levels higher. And guess what victory is in executive influence? When two levels up, publishes an order to tell you to do exactly what it is that you want to do, and it's even better when they've used one of your products to do it. That is, that is like nirvana for executive influence. If you aren't thinking about that, informing, educating, influencing, at the executive level every single day, instead of fighting upstream, swim downstream, and grab the tools that are there in the downstream, the ones that you want to do, and then help out your hire. And how do you do so? while sharing with your teammates to your left and right so they come along as part of the party with you. That's tough. That's relationships, that's communication, that's understanding, that's thinking out long term. It's being synchronized and nested. That is the art. And then you develop a reputation. You know, when I said don't say no to higher headquarters, when the op sergeant major calls your first sergeant and says, hey, do tw I need you to do this, this, and this. Does he say, Roger, we're here to support, we're part of the team, even though it might not be your turn, it might not be your fair share. And you build up idiosyncrasy credits and chits, reputation chits. And eventually, you know, the battalion or the squadron XO, because you've got the same relationship with your, with your XO, says, hey, hey, uh, hey, Malcolm, I need you to do this. And boy, it's just crazy. It's nuts. They've lost their mind at higher. Oh, my gosh. But he or she says, hey, sir, you know, Roger, we'll do that. We're, we're, we're prepared to do anything as you know. You know, have you considered the following things? That's not a no. Have you considered this, this, and this? And because you never say no and you never question and your organization doesn't do that, when you start to do that, guess what happens? The battalion XO says, holy crap. We must be wrong because they never hesitate. They never question. So when they do, because you have built the reputation and your organization has a reputation, and then what happens? They go back and they reassess and it doesn't come to you. And you become more effective because you've gained influence with hire. Can you do that? And you have the climate and the controls in for your organization to do that. And the higher you get up, the more effective this becomes. 
And then you have such a great relationship. Your first sergeant has such a great relationship with the operations sergeant major that of the six company and troop and batteries, you get, you know, the battalion, the squadron gets, you know, gets, uh, let's just say, 13 Pathfinder slots. Brigade's not going to take, or, you know, a battalion's not going to take any. You get 13. You're not going to get 13 in a battalion, but let's just say as an example. Six, six company troops or batteries. Who gets three and who gets two? Are you the one that they square away with three? Are you taking care of your people because you have such great influence and you've built a reputation that you get the extra chits? And oh, by the way, it's not just about you. Because if you're focused on your organization, when your platoon leaders get raided by the battalion or the squadron commander, and you ask for that number one or that number five, top five rating for your folks, does your battalion commander instantly say, yeah, you got the number one and you got the number three? No doubt. No doubt in my mind. Or are you the unresponsive, non-supportive, non-team playing type of higher headquarters that hasn't developed relationships and communicated effectively with higher? And when you ask for a rating, your platoon leaders don't get what they probably richly deserve. And who else gets hurt? They get hurt. They get hurt from a career standpoint. It's not just about you. It's about taking care of them and their careers and their development. Hugely important. Ask you to think about that as you go forward. Next slide. Please. Okay. Time. Where do you spend your time? Company troop battery level. Generally speaking, I believe that you should spend 75% of your time inside the organization, 25% outside. Use leveraged influence with your platoon leaders and XOs, that mission command style intent, and then 25% you're protecting, you're shielding, and you're influencing and shaping the external environment to both protect and to get after the priorities and to do what you're being asked to do from higher and developing those relationships outside. But also know that your battalion and squadron commanders are spending about 50-50. 50% time inside, 50% out. And your brigade commanders are spending 75% out and 25% in. Why do you think they can afford to spend that much time outside the organization? Why do you think they need to? Why do you think? Why do you think they can? Now you're, you're, what's that? Go ahead. Exactly. They have centralized select. They get the best lieutenant colonels in the United States Army centrally selected to command those organizations, and they have hopefully, the best company troop battery commanders that are selected to go in those positions. And because they trust and power two levels down. That's why. So just kind of understand that and know that at the division level, depending on the environment, it could be 90, 95%, 85% out. The higher you get up, the more time is out, the less time is in. Because that shaping, that external environment becomes much, much bigger, much, much broader, and you have to shape and influence and understand it at a much bigger level to both protect and influence out and shape and use leveraged influence through command and commanders and subordinates below you to be able to execute the orders. So just understand that's the environment. Could you go to the Warrior Resolve one? Should be hopefully next slide down maybe. Okay, I talked about enduring commander's intent. This is an example. There's two of them. I took brigade command, and this is something you could do at the company troop battery levels. I, I would implore you and think that you should. You see the goal. There's a vision statement on the bottom. Go into Iraq. What I want, finish it with honor, facilitate the transition to Iraq as emerging U.S. strategic partner in 2010-11. That was where, what we were a part of. That was the greater goal. And here are the priorities. Notice, team. Work as a team. Where is the brigade that I commanded? Fourth in the priority. Fourth. What's the priority between the Iraqi U.S. team? Iraqi U.S., not U.S. Iraqi. Interagency, then part of a division, multinational U.S. division, then a brigade team. Broader team of teams who coordinate continuously. This endured for about 18 months of my command. Six months going in and all the way through Iraq. These were the objectives. These were the things that I wanted every company troop battery commander two levels below to do every time their left foot hit the ground, no matter what mission that we got within the greater mission that we had in support of that vision and that goal. How do you frame what your objectives are for your organization in the long term that they understand are your priorities? And how do you frame them? One document. 
And then the environment changed. Next slide. We came back, and I changed it. Again, team of teams, still important. Different teams. Different teams. Discipline and standards, still at the top. Leadership. Individual and family resiliency, which was closer to the bottom, always important, now rose up to higher, to number two. Because we were resetting, we were reintegrating, and we were trying to reform, retrain, to be ready for full spectrum operations in the Pacific, if and when necessary. The environment changed, the vision changed, the objectives, priorities throughout that I wanted to endure for that year changed. And then missions came, and you have different purpose, key tasks, end state for each mission, but these things never changed during that period. And these were posters on the wall. And they were meant for two levels down, for your level. Something to think about. How are we doing on time? 15? Okay. Uh, talking a little bit about, about media. I do want to, uh, to, to, if we can go to the bridge slide, which should be about slide number two or three. I want you to think about things. Who's, who's been in the Army for more than 15 years? Anybody? Okay, just a couple of folks. For the last 15 years, the United States Army and the media have enjoyed a mutually beneficial relationship. That relationship has ensured that the American people and the American soldier, uh, go back up one, sorry. The American people and the American soldier, uh, excuse me, the American people knew the American soldier and their army through the lens of warfare with boots on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. Media were embedded in abundance with us in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that's how the people got to know their army. The problem is we are now at a strategic communications inflection point. Go back up one slide. And my point to you is that things have changed. We no longer have boots on the ground from a policy perspective in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have 190,000 soldiers, forward station deployed or supporting combatant commanders in 140 countries today. Yet the American people don't know that. There's a civ mill drift happening. That line of connectivity through the lens of warfare every single day that the American people got is now gone. And now what's happening is that drift and that connection that they got with applause in airports, with applause at football games, that is starting to go away because we are not there every single day. And why is it important that the American people understand the United States Army. What is our source of power as an army? I just said it. It's the American people. How is it manifested? It's manifested in three ways. Trust and confidence, recruiting, and dollars, fiscal dollars. We enjoyed all those in great, great abundance the last 15 years, your entire careers for everyone in this class. We take it for granted. You probably, you know nothing different. Highest trust and confidence, all the recruits we needed for the NEN strength of 575,000 for the active force, and all the dollars and overseas contingency and GWAT funding that we needed to, to, to execute the wars. And now, guess what? Trust and confidence, it's fleeting, it's temporal in nature. You lose it in buckets, you earn it in drips. We are getting looked at and scrutinized for 15 years worth of decisions, things like TBI, you know traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, decisions that were made, things like that are in the news, rightfully so. Wounded warriors, a lot of things that are in the news. There's even some negative things about policy decisions and decisions that were made during the war, a lot of investigations, IG, et cetera, and that's fine. But the point is, we're not there every single day. In American society today, temporal and fleeting means if you're not there every day, you start to fade. Look at what's happened in this election cycle. Less than 40, or 49%, less than 50% now of the American people think that we are the strongest military in the world. Trust and confidence just naturally starts to fade, especially in this culture. Recruiting. We have to recruit 62,000 soldiers this year. Active duty alone. It's harder to recruit those 62,000 than it was when we were trying to recruit against an end strength of 85,000 more than we have today, 575,000. And we were recruiting against a 17 to 24 year old population of 34 million, of which 
29%, 2.9 out of every 10 are recruitable from a physical, mental, or incarceration standpoint. And when we look at those who have a propensity to serve, we are trying to tap into a pool of 380,000 young Americans to fill the force, the same high quality, all volunteer force that the American people have come to know and that you only know and that many of you understand who have served in other armies about the United States Army and our soldiers today. That is tough. It is not by happenstance that this is the first time in a decade the Army has 60-second commercials running to try and recruit young Americans. Dollars. We are in a fiscally constrained environment. Look at my tweet today. I'm sure Chuck back there has seen it. We are, all of our money is going towards people, 62 cents on every dollar, and, and the rest of it is going towards ensuring that we are currently ready to execute that 190K in 140 countries and what we're being asked to every day. We're consuming our readiness every day. And we are mortgaging our future readiness and modernization because we don't have the dollars to put towards that. And that's why people are going down in force structure because you have to have those just enough trained, a third of our force, to execute what we're being asked to execute today. So my point to you is that we have to be active, proactive in telling the story as leaders, commanders, and public affairs officers of what our Army is doing to the American people. Go to the next slide. Next slide. I talked about that. Next slide. And my point is, we have to be baselined. You as leaders need to be baselined in the Army messages. You need to know what's happening in the Army. And we have to deliver messages to the American people. And I bend those messages every month, send them in Chief of Public Affairs, sends across people, policy, resources, war fighting, of everything that's going on in your Army, our Army. And then we send them out, and we try and combat the river, is, a river of misperception about what, what the American people think. Not skilled, not educated, low quality, only needs soft, special forces, or the Air Force. You're going to get damaged if your son or daughter comes in the military, TBI, PTSD, sexual assault. How do we combat that to break that 380,000 into a larger pool? We have to get after the audiences. Internal Army, the National Capital Region where the policymakers and the influencers are and the resourcers, and then the rest of America. Because guess what? Where is America located? The United States. I really meant to say, where is our Army located? Our, our, our active army is located in the smiley face of America. They're in the Bible Belt. We're in the south and the southeast. We're in rural America. It is important that we engage with Columbus, Georgia, right outside the gate. It is important that we engage with Watertown, Fayetteville, Clarksville. But guess what? Is that where the majority of America lives? And are they not, are they not as dependent on us as we are them? And do we not know them because we engage them every day? We sure do. And we think that that's engaging with America. It is not. America lives in the mass media markets, the coastlines. They live in other places and other places where other services and organizations have an advantage. We have to get out and about and tell the story to the rest of America, to the average adult that doesn't understand it, to the young person we want to recruit, to the centers of influence, business, defense, community, industries out there, to be able to tell the story and connect back into the policymakers and the legislators so that we can get after the three things that are the source of power through the American people. Otherwise, we will not have the Army that we enjoy today. I'm here to tell you, this is a multi-year strategic communications campaign plan that our Army is embarking on, and I've briefed the Secretary and the Chief of Staff of the Army that's going to come down. And we've done analysis. I'm going to whip through this mission analysis for you. Go. Whip through a bunch of slides here. Go ahead. This is the Meet Your Army. Go, go, go. Keep going. One more slide. Okay. What I have done, uh, go back one. What we have done is we've looked at where the population of America lives, where the centers of influence are, where this, where, and, and we look at where the media markets are. We know where our messages are getting out and where they're not, the yellow. And then what we've done, we look at where the 17 to 24 year olds live. And what we figured out is where we are least effective, where we can be the most effective in telling the Army story. Next slide. Bam. These are the cities we have to go to. And this is going to start coming down with regional, geographic, and functional responsibilities. You as a company commander, my point to you as a future company troop battery commander is understand what's happening with our Army. Do your job at your level, but know what the broader challenges and problems of our Army are when it comes to strategic communications, media relations, and where we are as an Army. Next slide. And also, guess what? You may be part of this. We are bringing company, troop, battery commanders, and first sergeants through brigade commanders back into the beltway to tell the story, to reinforce what we at the strategic level are telling through the tactical mouths of 
the leaders out there executing Atlantic Resolve, Inherent Resolve, Freedom Sentinel, Pacific Pathways, in the uh, Corps of Engineers and what they do in the districts for our nation every single day, the waterways of America. And we bring them in, and we've done about 13 rotations. One of you may be in it, company commander, troop commander, battery commander, briefing, and they've done it. Media roundtable with Pentagon Press. Go over to the Hill, talk to staffers, talk to congressmen, talk to Army leadership, SEC Army, chief of staff of the Army, OSD, SEC DEF level, the joint staff. Go to think tanks to reinforce the messages and what our Army is doing, what I've just told you, with the strategic themes that we put out every day. You don't think that you have impact at the company troop battery level? You're darn right. We're tapping into it, and I'm bringing you to D.C. And it's happened 13 times, and it's going to roll. So know that, yes, you are important, and what you do, we are trying to tap into it so we can help tell that Army story to just that one audience of the Beltway. All right, so with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause. I've got about probably less than 10 minutes. Uh, I could talk about a lot of different things, uh, but uh, you know, you know, one thing I do want to leave you with before I, before I do close out after questions is remember what team you're on and remember who you're talking to. We are all proud of the patches we have on our left shoulders, right? You guys all are, or on your right shoulders. You're proud of the badges you wear here, right? And that's great. They're tre tremendous because they communicate to ourselves and to each other. It helps with the spree, morale. It helps with you know, personal confidence because you've accomplished something. But when you go out and you talk to America or you represent in America, I'm going to give you an example. Just remember what team you're part of. I-70, driving by the 93, 93% of America has never served in the Army, is driving by I-70 to look up at a water tank, water tower, water tower, right next to Fort Riley. And they look at it, they don't even know Fort Riley's there because they don't even know there's a fort, they don't know who Riley is. You drive by it, and there's this green square painted on top of that water, on that side of that water tank. Connected to it is a green triangle, and right in the middle of that is this red one. We all know what that means, but the average American drives by and says, wow, I can't wait to see the Christmas-colored water tower number two as I drive down I-70. Does that mean there's one cow in the pasture over there? Or maybe it's one helicopter. on? They have no idea, because who are we communicating to? We, as an army, love to talk to ourselves and think we're talking to everybody else. They don't live in our minds. I would argue we suck at that. And we're disadvantaged because of where we're located. We're disadvantaged because culturally we talk to ourselves, think we're talking to everybody else. And we're disadvantaged because as we try and connect to the American people, we, our center of gravity is people, and we are the biggest service, and we are the biggest, second biggest employer behind Walmart in the country, so we are more reliant on connecting to American people. And so, what is painted up there now? What do you think is there? I'll tell you in a minute. What is the most recognizable icon in the, in the United States of America for the military right now today? What do you think it is? Icon. What? For the military. Okay, yeah. You're, you're, you'll, you get a second guess A. But uh, a lot of people think it's a globe and anchor. Marine Corps, right? It's not. It has been overtaken by this. Because this is what they see. This patch, they understand it's U.S. Army. This is U.S. Army. You are U.S. Army. That is the team you're on. I came here and said I'm a soldier and I'm a soldier for life. I'm on the Army team. And when you communicate to external audiences, they, that's how they see you. Understand that. Know that. It's a branding thing, but it's hugely important. It's hugely important because they don't know who we are or understand who we are. Okay? So I just ask you to think about that when you go forward. Just remember that you're on a broader team. I don't care if you're special forces, infantry. It doesn't matter what race, color, creed, what background, what specialty you are, and what unit you're in. Just know that you're in that. Your organization, what they do is important. Talk about it. Understand it on the baseline of the U.S. Army. Cool? All right. I'll take questions, please. Yes, please. Uh, sir, I'm Kevin Prangas from Memphis Beach, Seminar 4. Uh, you said that the art of communication is something that we need to practice trying to improve yep. every day. Um, my question is, how do we go about that, sir? Sure. You have to expose yourself first. So you have to expose yourself. So you have to understand, and, and you have to AR yourself all the time. 
I would practice talking. If you notice, notice I pause. I really try and not say the uhs and the ums. Have buddies critique you and help you. Expose yourself to briefing opportunities. It's about, it's about day to day practice. It's about writing. How do you write? Effectively understanding how the Army communicates, whether it's in PowerPoint or whether it's in a memorandum format. You would be surprised that people do not understand grammar, sentence structure, spelling, even when we have word check, spell check. It's amazing. So it's about exposing yourself and getting those opportunities and continually learning and having your peers help you, having your spouse help you, having your girlfriend or boyfriend help you. Uh, it is about watching others and trying to emulate those things that seem to go over very well. Look at those and look at what they do, body language, tone, intonation, again, what they're doing. So it's all of those things, and it's, it's A-R-ing yourself, and then seeing yourself through the eyes of others who, who you are communicating to. I would never shy away from an opportunity to talk or brief in front of somebody, and every single thing is different. You should get a lot of those opportunities here. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, school today, my, my daughter... 11 years old, it's amazing how she, she gets up and has to brief and, and has to give a presentation. I never had to do that as a kid. It's, it's great to see, and we need to expose ourselves more to it. Because guess what, our genera this generation, you know, maybe yours and the one behind you, they're, they're, they're all about communicating through this. And we're less apt to want to do that, yet you guys like to connect to others. So just, I would say, do that. It, it's hard to say, do this, this, and this, except to say, you got to AR yourself, you got to practice, and you got to specifically go in and say, I'm trying to do this. On slides, you know, when you go up and brief and you look at slides, does, you know, look at it. Does everyone understand it? Would my mom understand what I'm saying? If my mother understands what I'm saying, that's a good barometer, then I probably am going to communicate effectively to whatever audience is out there. And is the, does the slide in the briefing stand, but does it stand on its own if I don't have to talk about it? And what do I want to highlight? You don't read a slide because people can read. How do you highlight one or two or three points that are not on that slide that support what is on the slide that they can already read? An important nuance on briefing. Most people miss it. <laughs> Tell me what is not there or why that is important and what I'm seeing and give me a little bit more. That's just briefing alone, okay? All right, next question. Yes, sir. Correct. And uh, you were also talking about meetings, and so uh, right. time in versus the inputs that, that come out of the meetings. And so I was hoping you could talk about uh, efficiency versus effectiveness and communication in meetings and, and how to manage the time. Yeah, so again, I, you know, we meet just to meet. So I think you have to, you, you've kind of answered the question a lot in how you've asked it, quite frankly. Uh, and you're exactly right. So what you have to do, again, you've got to understand your priorities. You have to have a structure to the meeting. You've got to put somebody in charge of that structure of the meeting. You've got to hold it to the time. You've got to be on time. And you have got to, and then you've got to empower those for, exact, for, for what they've got to do. If you have a training meeting as a company or a troop battery commander, boy, every single platoon sergeant and platoon leader should have a task, exactly what they've got to do as part of that meeting and come into it with inputs and with outputs. I mean, exactly like you said. We're coming in with these things. This is what we're trying to achieve coming out of it. And this is how long we're going to do it. If you have a meeting just to have a meeting or to huddle, which we like to do, then, 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 then you're wrong. And how often do you need to bring everyone in is another thing you need to think about. Uh, I don't think that I talk about the art of the touch point in here because I just came from another briefing. And that is a lot of people say there's an issue on X or Y. And they bring, let's have a meeting, bring everyone in. No. So if you have tasks, let's say you have enduring tasks that you've got everyone tasked out to do. How, do you, how have you set forth your time so that with milestones and touch points that the first platoon leader or the XO or the first sergeant comes into you once a week for 20 minutes to talk about this two topics with you alone and you give them guidance so that they are doing what? They're not wasting their time. As a commander and a leader, I never wanted my, my folks to waste their time wondering what I was thinking, what guidance they might need and moving off on a tangent wasting time working on a product that they didn't need to be working on. And so touch points where they come in, a quick 10, 15 minute huddle, this is what you need to do, move back out and you go out. And how do you orchestrate, how do you schedule those and not schedule every one of those with everybody wasting time for the rest of your organization? You know, and so big meetings, training meetings, uh, command and staff type of functions, the admin. I think as a company troop battery commander, you should bring your people in, unless it's a, an order, an operations order for a mission. You should only be bringing them in for two sets of meetings, for the training meeting 
and for the, you know, the admin log slash command and staff type of meeting. That's it. Everything else should be individual touch points or by you leading through your shoes and walking out and seeing folks and leading by, you know, by personal, by personally saying, hey, how are we on this? Don't call meetings, go to people individually because there's so much to do, they can't waste their time coming back and forth to meetings. Uh, but your input output thing, absolutely spot on. Don't know if I was helpful for you, but uh, I'll tell you, being organized, you know, organization, I cannot overstate the more efficient you are in organization, organizing your email, organizing your priorities, organizing the functions and decentralizing, and then knowing just how often to meet and what to meet and making very clear your vision and guidance and the milestones and checkpoints that you want to look at and having that structure and the more organized you are in, in, in understanding what your organization is about, the more time you have to lead and to mentor and to do what it is that you need to do as a leader instead of, you know, listen, if you don't, and, and the other thing is feed the beast. If you do not feed the beast, the beast will eat you. And the beast is higher, right? If you don't feed the beast, the beast will eat you. Okay, next question. So do you have a time for, a for what? A photo. A photo? I'm going to do one more question. Talk, sorry. I'm going to pull rank. One more question. Oh, all right. I was wondering, you know, who's going to get their butt chewed for asking the question after I leave. So. About what? The delivering strategic messages, like strategic messaging with media. Uh, yeah. So let's go to the, um, go, can we go to the CPA rules slide? It's, uh, it should be the last slide. I'm going to leave you with some of the rules. Hopefully you've seen them. Uh, go down. No, back up. Up. Oh, boy, that was bad. Okay. Um, you, you know, your opportunities with the media, uh, you don't know how many opportunities you're going to get, you know, at the company true battery level, but, but a few things, you know, strategic messages, you know, you got to be grounded, understand what's happening with the Army. Uh, stay in your lane as always. So stay within your lane and say, you know, and, and comment on, you know, so you had to articulate, okay, how are the resources, if we're in a resource constrained environment or if we're in a globally engaged Army, what is your piece of that? You have to understand it and articulate it through your terms. Uh, that's what I would say, is, is understand the hire's message and articulate it through the lens that you see things is, is number one. And with, uh, go back up, keep, no, keep going, up, up, yeah, no, PL, uh, and if you want this, PL Keys to Success, look at this, look at the leader book, this is what, this is what I as a battalion commander told my, my leaders, and there's a leader book there as well, but um, number one, don't fear the media, don't coddle the media. Uh, number two, rule of proportionality. Understand when you need to engage them. Know what on the record, off the record, on background are. Um, there's a lot of pieces of this I could probably see you after because I'm getting the hook here, okay? But uh, let's talk about that afterwards, okay? All right. So, hey, listen, I want to leave you with, uh, with one thing. And it's, uh, it's something I want you to think about your entire career. It's the three Fs. The three Fs. It's something, no matter what you do, they will endure uh, for your entire life. And I'd ask you to really think about these things. The first is family. Whatever you call family, you need to take care of it throughout your career, throughout your life. Whether that is a spouse, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, whether that is parents, whether that's your buddy to your left or right or your organization, whatever you consider family, just know that the only thing that's going to be with you throughout your career is your family. That's what's going to be with you at the end, so you better take care of it, you better cherish it, understand it, and don't neglect it. Number two is your faith. When I say faith, that may or may not be religious because that or spiritual, that is up to you. But faith is what you believe in. Faith in yourself, faith in your buddies, faith in your organization, your team, faith in your family, and maybe faith in another entity, whatever that is. But at the end, you're going to have your family, you're going to have faith in what you believed in, and that's something that you don't want to lose focus on and keep with you throughout your career. And the last thing that wraps it all up is fulfillment. Fulfillment. Fulfillment comes from the sense of accomplishment, the sense of self-worth that you gain from doing something. And I will tell you, serving something greater than yourself, that is a way to gain fulfillment. And I'm here to tell you that you are all extremely fortunate and made an exceptionally good choice to maintain, to gain and maintain fulfillment. And I'm going to be biased for a second with my international partners, so please bear with me. But if you think about the last 15 years 
or the last 75 years, there is no organization that has done more for our citizens, has done more for the United States of America, has done more for the cause of freedom, the cause of justice, democratic ideals, for anybody else, for everyone in the globe, for all of humankind than the United States Army. We have had more boots on the ground in more places affecting more people. So if you think about fulfillment and serving something greater than yourself, you name me an organization, you name me a team where you can get more fulfillment for doing more for our nation and for all of humankind and for the globe than the United States Army. So just know that you are on or are serving with the greatest team on earth and that is the United States Army team. I mean, talk about serving something greater than yourself. And I want to thank all of you for what you do to serve the United States Army, for what you do to serve our nation or your nation and serving in your army or your armed forces and what you do every day. Uh, thanks a lot. There's a lot on your shoulders. All the trust and confidence. Wish I was back in your shoes. We are counting on you. Know you're going to do great. Enjoy the course. And thanks a lot, everybody. Who will